Next, we can look at the cost of equity. And the cost of equity is, we have three methods, capital asset pricing model. The second is the DCF formula for dividend discount method. And third is your own bond yield plus some judgmental risk premium, recognizing that if you have both bondholders and common shareholders, bondholders get a certain return, fairly easily determined by yield to maturity. And then we add to it a premium that your shareholders would expect in order to be common shareholders rather than being debt holders. So first, CAPM, we've done this also quite a few times, and there's the formula, our tried and true formula, with risk-free rate plus the beta times the, the market risk premium. A couple of comments is that we use the long-term government bond for the risk-free rate. The second thing is that we use a rate of 35 to 6% for market risk premium. You'll see a range based on the time frame by which the analysis of the market was, was done. So it's typically in this range for just about any time period that's reasonable uh, since we've had the S&P 500. Next is the estimates for beta may vary and you might see some wide confidence intervals, but we take that as a risk of using this approximation method called CAPM. So here's an example with some data. Again, we'll hop into Excel. So go to the CAPM tab. So R equals and then equals risk-free rate, which is 0.056 plus beta, which is 1.2 times uh, 0.06 as the market risk premium. And that's 12.8%. Let's format that properly. And let's copy it so we can see it more easily. Um, and that's the formula, right? So we've seen this many times. I'm sure that's something you can all do. So that's method one. Method two is dividend discount model. And we're going to look at it slightly differently. We're going to look at the return having two components. One component, if you look at this formula, you'll see that it's the price that you pay at time zero divided into the dividend you get for time one. And that's similar to what we did uh, quite a while ago when we looked at measuring the rate of return. This piece in red represents the dividend yield if you bought this stock now and you wait a year and you get one year's dividend. Then to that, we have to uh, add what is the growth rate of the company itself. Because two motivations for a shareholder, one is dividend yield and the other is capital appreciation, namely the stock price goes up. And uh, this section here, this poor this here represents the formula we use, use many times to compute the D1. D1 equals dividend times zero at time zero times one plus the growth rate for that one year. You could use historical rates only if you believe that those are relevant for future expectations. Otherwise, there are many analysts who follow companies. You'll find 10 to 50 analysts typically for a widely held public stock. And so you go to Yahoo Finance or uh, Value Line, or now that we know how to use WallStreetJournal.com, you go to MarketWatch. So here we have some assumptions, and we'll hop into Excel. So let's first com compute the dividend portion. So um, equals or t uh, plus um, the numerator is D1. We don't have D1, but we have D0, so 3.26, and we multiply that times. 1 plus the growth rate, 0.058. And that's the numerator. The denominator is the price you paid, which is 50. So that is the uh, dividend yield. And then it'll be plus the, uh, the growth. And the growth is we're given 0.058. And so the total equals that plus that and we can express all this in more familiar terms and that's what we get a dividend yield and I'll copy that below of um, 3.26 which is the current dividend rate grow it by one year by multiplying times 1 plus G and divided by the price you paid in this case $50 Growth is that growth assumption we had already. So we would expect our, our value of the company to grow by 5.8. Total yield that we expect 
um, of two components is 12.7%. All right, so that's cost of equity using DDM. Next is uh, earnings retention. This is a way just to test out uh, the validity of our assumption for the growth. And so what we look at is the retention rate, growth equals retention rate times return on equity. And that means how much, how much can we grow the uh, common equity of the firm uh, based on our profits? And so we can grow if we make money and, and invest it wisely. However, if we give all the money out to, in dividends, we don't have it, so we, we don't grow at all. So that's why we need this particular adjustment. I'll just highlight it. This adjustment here reflects the fact that we could, if we kept all the money, then the growth in the company would be equal to the ROE times the amount of money we now have to use. If we distribute all of it, we would get no growth um, based on ROE. We just kind of continue going as we were. And anything in the middle, we need this adjustment, which is what percent of the profit we make will we keep this year? And so that's what this is. One minus the payout is essentially retention, right? It's the flip side. I retain what I don't pay out. And so in this example, I'll just show how it would work. If the payout ratio is 62%, ROE is 15, then when we put it in the formula, one minus 62% times ROE equals 5.7%. And that's pretty close to the long run growth rate we used on the prior slide of 5.8. So we're kind of triangulating or validating uh, whether that assumption is uh, reasonable. All right, so that's early earnings retention model as a way to determine or test the growth assumption. So the other approach is using a little judgment. I know that's dangerous, but here's this reflects that, okay, I have a rate I can determine for my cost of debt. And I believe that the markets, uh, particularly for our stock, has a premium that they want over the bond rate to own our stock. And so it's simply this 10%, uh, which is a determinable number, that's yield to maturity. And then we use 3.2, and that is just for what we think would be for our company based on current circumstances. And we'll get to a rate of 13.2. Again, uh, this is a, a bit of crystal ball, right? But, but it is something we can use, uh, particularly if we have a broad understanding of the markets and the company. So when we put it all together, a objective, but again, arbitrary method is it, let's take the three methods we just used, which is a CAPM derived return plus the DCF or dividend discount model derived uh, return plus this kind of judgmental approach, and we take an average. There's no magic to an average, right? In fact, you might say the cap M should be weighted more than one third because it's more rigorously determined, but we're in this ballpark of somewhere between 12.4, 13.2. If we took a straight average, we would be at 